All right. Um, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at uh, EFF Austin in conjunction with the No Way on Prop A Coalition uh, Roundtable panel discussion about uh, surveillance in Austin, Texas, specifically under um, the actions of the Austin Police Department. And oh, not just surveillance, but just digital civil liberties in general. And we really wanted to bring in um, around the debate around Prop A in this city and about the pros and cons of potentially giving our local police department a uh, fairly large additional amount of money. We wanted to, many other groups in town are discussing the pros and cons along many different axes, such just as fiscal responsibility, uh, racial justice and equity, et cetera. But given EFF Austin's longstanding role as an Austin-based digital civil liberties organization, we thought it would be good to tackle the conversation from the angle of digital civil liberties, specifically related to topics of surveillance and, and digital search warrants and just the, the things that APD does in the technological space. What we know, what maybe we don't know at times and where greater transparency could help and just try to really approach what could be a major fiscal decision for the city from a place of being informed. So to that end, um, we've assembled a number of people who are uh, experts in various capacities on this topic. Um, we will be making this video available on our YouTube channel later. And if you couldn't make this talk, we encourage you to watch it and share it with your friends there, especially your friends who may be undecided on Prop A. Um, most people, it's a fairly polarizing topic. Most people probably already are for or against it. But uh, for those friends you have, who are a little more undecided on the topic and maybe some of the other arguments pro or against don't really speak to them, but maybe they do care about these technological issues. Maybe especially you have some libertarian friends where this tends to be important. We encourage you to share the video with them. Um, to introduce our panelists here, I'm not going to read their full bios, but they're very impressive. So I'm just gonna give you a brief sense of who we have joining us. Um, we have John Anderson, who's with the Austin Chronicle. He um, has had a long career in photojournalism and um, is very, I think, relevant to any discussion of APD and surveillance and technology in this city. His uh, photographs and activism a decade ago during Occupy Wall Street uncovered uh, surveillance of the protests by APD. And recently, he was one of the primary contributors to the Austin Chronicles reporting on Blue Leaks, which was a big a uh, trove of documents that hackers obtained from police departments and fusion centers throughout this country, including many about APD and our local fusion center, ORIC. So we figured John's reporting and knowledge on this would be invaluable to the discussion. We also have joining us Scott Henson. Scott Henson has a long, long, illustrious career as a local uh, activist and doer of the good. Um, he is currently the interim executive director at Just Liberty, a 501c4 focused on criminal justice reform in Texas. He's also was the, one of the activists responsible for the creation of the Austin Police Monitor's Office in 2000. He was the um, he worked on the Police Accountability Project with the ACLU of Texas and um, also worked as the executive director of the Innocence Project in Texas. So um, we're very honored to be joined by Scott here. We also are joined by uh, Jennifer Lauren, who she is at uh, UT uh, Austin School of Law. She is on the faculty there. She um, is an expert on how law and institutional design shape the functioning of criminal justice institutions. And she's the co-author of Police Misconduct, Law and Litigation, which is the current leading treatise in that area of civil rights litigation. And finally, we have uh, Effie Fulberg with us. And Effie is currently a criminal defense attorney with the Travis County Public Defender's Office um, and during his time as a public defender, he has worked on a number of uh, things relevant to our discussion here. He was a member of a defense team that struck down an anti-panhandling ordinance on First Amendment grounds, and most relevant to this discussion, created and executed a legal strategy to invalidate all search warrants uh, for cell phone and social media accounts issued by the Lexington, Kentucky Police Department. So uh, welcome all to our very accomplished, illustrious panel. We are so honored you agree to join us and talk on this very, very important topic. I have a few um, questions that I've sort of pre-prepared that I thought might make for good points of discussion, but this is just a guide. We can go where the conversation takes us, especially based on what you, the points you want to make and the topics you feel qualified on speaking on. So um, I'm going to kick it off. 
with uh, a question that um, anybody who wants to chime in is welcome to. But um, so I mentioned a little bit at the top that Austin, for those who don't know, has an institution known as ORIC, or the Austin Regional Intelligence Center. Um, Regional Intelligence Centers are a post 9-11 creation that was designed to fix some of the intelligence failures that led to 9-11 and let law enforcement entities, um, ideally in a perfect world, share data more easily and freely between each other. But for many years, ORIC and many other fusion centers have been dogged by uh, concerns about various civil liberties violations, many of which uh, John reported on in the Chronicle as part of Blue Weeks. Um, so earlier this year, the main House of Representatives voted on a piece of legislation that attempted to shut down the main information analysis center, the regional fusion center in its area. Ultimately, their Senate voted to maintain the center's surveillance and data gathering operations. Do we have a sense of how successful such legislation would be in Texas? What would be its major obstacles and what would be the best way to initiate such legislation? Wow, well, I, I can take a stab at that, I guess. That, I thought it might be in your wheelhouse, Scott, <laughs> given your long history in this space. Well, the, the fusion centers in Texas um, are, uh, frankly have not been as high profile, have not had the kind of, of uh, uh, sustained public criticism so far that would lead to, uh, you know, legislation really having legs. Um, in, in my opinion, that is in part because uh, their reach has from really day one exceeded their grasp. Um, uh, the fusion centers have really never been very functional. I've never heard of anyone identifying any criminal case that developed out of their work. Um, they, they receive reports from law enforcement and all of these reports from, I don't even know what you'd call it, call them, you know, people out in the public who just file, you know, oh, I saw this, it's a problem or whatever. And, and there's these, they're just a, a, a ocean of memoranda from every little minute report they get. But, you know, especially in the, in the when I focused on them was really sort of in the, in the years following 9-11 when they were setting it up and, and I worked for the ACLU at the time. And, and so I haven't tracked them as closely recently, but, um, but what you would see is they would get just a, an ocean of, of crappy leads that no one seemed to follow up on and and they would have all of this information uploaded to them where um, you could see where okay given all the databases all the information all of the, the the different information streams that are going there there is potential for you know civil liberties violations for for data mining for types of of um, uh, investigative tactics that, that, that could be invasive and problematic. And my personal opinion, frankly, is that we have been lucky that they have been run so incompetently. And, um, uh, and really the failures of like, you know, government to sort of, you know, stop tripping over its own feet um, and the fact that even within law enforcement, I think people in law enforcement never really got to the point where they thought, okay, here's what this is really good for. I can use this for this on a regular basis. So you'd see a lot of stuff uploaded. You'd see, um, uh, and, and actually uh, John may have better information than me on this because I know after Occupy, that, um, they found that there had been massive monitoring of the um, uh, of the protests and the fusion centers were getting all this intelligence. I have never seen evidence that that intelligence is getting used in any effective way in day-to-day -day investigations. And it's been kind of a big, um, a, a big waste. And a lot of the criticism from what I read in Maine was people saying, what what are we getting from this? What's the point of this? If you're not actually accomplishing anything, if you can't show results. So, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like that, that when they laid out what the fusion centers would do and what information 
they would gather. And then, frankly, the Texas legislature began sort of just mandating that all sorts of, of information would be made available to them. And you, you, you looked at that in the early aughts and thought, well, gosh, this is, you know, uh, really going to be problematic. And uh, my, you know, distant observation, again, it's been a while since I've, I've really dived into them deeply, is that their, their incompetence trumped the threat. Um, but there may be others that have other opinions about that. <laughs> well, th thank you very much, Scott. That was a very uh, thoughtful reply. Uh, politic, despite being forceful uh, in its criticisms of the failures of the current system. Um, if any of our other panelists have additional thoughts they'd like to chime in on what Scott said there, they're welcome. Otherwise, I can move on to my next question, which may somewhat tee up some of John's thoughts on this. But uh, if anybody, uh, yes, Jennifer? I'll, I'll just hop in with a very small point, um, which is um, <laughs> the generalizable version of the point is that I think in thinking about policing, drawing examples from other jurisdictions, et cetera, it's always important to remember that policing and um, just sort of the operation of, the crim of criminal legal systems varies tremendously across the United States, right? I mean, it's just so, you know, the basic point here is like, Texas doesn't really look like Maine um, in a variety of reasons, for a variety of reasons, including specifically here. One of the things about Maine and the potential leverage of state legislation is that there's one, there was just one Maine fusion center and it was under the auspices of the state. So the state legislator, legislature what could do something about it and was probably the only entity actually that could do anything about it. Um, Texas is not in that situation. There are, correct me if I'm wrong, eight fusion centers uh, in Texas. And in fact, they're arranged in, in different ways, even among them, in terms of what level of governmental authority has any measure of control over them. Now, this presents, um, you know, potentially a, a sort of you know, regulatory downside, right? There are lots of different sites to get at. On the other hand, it also presents some additional targets of opportunity in terms of thinking about regulatory levers. For example, one can work at the level of Austin city government and potentially affect some change in the way in which Austin's fusion center is run, even if one can't get at what's going on across the state. So I always think it's important um, for uh, for those interested in 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 sort of police accountability and policing reform to remember the uh, the importance of what goes on at the local level and hear that that's true as well. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think that's uh, excellent additional context. It really fits with uh, my continuing drumbeat of that. Uh, we have to focus on the local level if we want reform in this area. Um, so uh, my next question, and I suspect this probably will mainly be a question for John, but once again, everyone who wants to chime in should chime in. Um, so as we know, largely from the reporting that John did on the Bluey's hacks and the documents that were obtained therein, um, sharing anti-police and other quote unquote dissident content on social media has historically led to users uh, to such users being added to law enforcement databases, uh, very prominently in the case of local environmental activist here in Austin, uh, Louis Monsivius. Um, Louis's placement in that database was made known by the Blue Weeks hack. Is there a way for citizens and individuals to determine if they're in such databases? And is there any kind of action that can be taken to make this information systematically transparent? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, Obviously, there's the Texas Public Information Act, um, but an um, awful lot of this material can be uh, denied from being released. Um, as Scott mentioned, I, I obtained a, a large amount of documents on Occupy Austin. Um, the Fusion Center was producing bulletins probably two or three times a week, these three, four or five page bulletins. Um, documenting the movement, covering everything they did at City Hall and elsewhere. Um, I was able to obtain those because when I made the request for them, um, the Occupy movement was over. And so um, 
either both APD and or the AG's office decided that this did not um, need to be with need to be withheld. Um, so I was able to get those. And in the case of uh, Lewis um, on Clevius, um, yeah, I don't know how he would have gotten those if if uh, it hadn't been hacked. Um, I don't think they would have released those. Uh, and and really, that's that's the only way is people can request them through the uh, Texas Public Information Act, but um, they'll likely be denied to be released. Yeah, and I would add to that that the standard under the Public Information Act, which um, and this provision was gutted about 25 years ago in 1996 by a Supreme Court case, Texas Supreme Court case called Holmes v. Morales, um, and then the legislature instead of fixing it codified the bad decision. And so basically under the Texas Public Information Act, um, they don't have to release that information until there is a final conviction and the case is completely over. And so, you know, if you haven't been charged and it has gone all the way through the process, you know, to a conviction or acquittal or, you know, the end of the end of the line, they don't have to release it to you, and especially anything that is is looked at as intelligence gathering and such, uh, they simply won't. And so for an individual like that, who has not yet been not just charged, but convicted, finally convicted, um, you simply have no legal right to that. So I agree with John that, that, uh, that without the Blue Leaks, you would not have seen them. And um, I can move on to our next question, or if Jennifer, if you have thoughts, um, I'm happy to hear them. I actually do have a smallest uh, question from an audience member that I think does tie into a lot of the discussion right now, which is we were talking a bit about the differences of a large state like Texas versus a small one like Maine. How does Texas stack up to other large states uh, like California? Like, are we doing substantially worse or better on these uh, problems compared to other large states and their fusion center uh, structure. And it's fine if nobody knows the answer to that. I'm just yeah, forwarding an audience yeah. question. I don't have good. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't know. Okay. I, um, I'll just offer a couple of things. I, I don't know the answer with respect to fusion centers specifically, although there is certainly diversity uh, among them and, you know, Back a half decade ago or so, it was actually the case that some Texas fusion centers were sort of being pointed to as national models just because they had anything approaching a set of sort of, you know, policies that they were actually disclosing. Um, however, uh, sort of um, open textured <laughs> those policies might have been. Um, I will say, though, with respect to um, the question of sort of law enforcement surveillance technology more broadly, it's certainly the case that we could point to a number of other localities. I'm not thinking so much at the state level, but now thinking more at the local level, um, including in California, thinking of, you know, Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley. It's not just a California thing, though. Seattle, uh, New York City, um, a number of localities have passed um, local measures that in, that that ensures much more transparency and sort of um, community input in decision making around uh, law enforcement um, surveillance technology in particular. And so that's that's something to be aware of. Um, I just also wanted to add one other point, going off of what Scott and John were saying about the difficulty of someone who's been sort of who's, whose name has been invoked right uh, in uh, documents or reports to fusion centers, etc. Um, the difficulty of them even discovering that that that's happened, and just to sort of you know sort of take that point even farther, um, the fact that it is so difficult for individuals to be aware of the fact that they are implicated in these investigative documents just sort of um, is sort of at the heart of why it's so difficult 
to have any sort of legal scrutiny, right, of these practices, because there's there's almost never, <laughs> right, someone who says, oh, I, I, you know, my rights are implicated here, right, either because I'm actually now being criminally charged, and I'm going to figure out why that was, or because I want to bring a lawsuit. There's just, you know, an infinite number of, of sort of known unknown <laughs> parties there. Um, and so the courts never get to sort of intervene. And we have a lot of, it's, I'd say the Fusion Center is one element of that, but there are all sorts of, of databases and such that have the same scenario. We had legislation this session um, that did not pass um, to uh, uh, allow people to figure out whether they have been included in the criminal street gang database, for example. And, um, you know, your people, the cop mace may pull, pull you over. It was the motorcycle clubs that were really most upset about this um, because they would get um, uh, included in the database basically just for wearing a leather vest. And, um, you know, there are, you know, uh, criminal biker gangs, but the overwhelming majority are not. And, and, and they were sort of all just being lumped together. And, uh, and it's virtually impossible to, to even figure out if you're in there. And so, uh, you know, it's not just the fusion center where, where this comes up. Um, uh, you know, what, are you in the database? What are they doing with the data? We can almost never know that except for when it shows up in an individual criminal case. And even then, um, as, I'm, as Effie could tell you, most criminal cases don't get all the way to trial. It's not like they all get vetted. Um, even then, um, lots of plea bargains happen before anybody's really you know, vetted all the evidence in the case. So um, it's, there's a lot of opacity here. We don't, we don't know exactly how all this is, is, is being used. Um, the last thing I'd say here is that um, since we are here, you know, discussed in the context of Prop A is, is sort of how this discussion was raised. Um, you know, Prop A would add somewhere between five and 700 new law enforcement officers to our 1600 police officer force now. And um, uh, quite frankly, the police department today annually responds to fewer calls than they did 20 years ago, right? Um, crime is significantly down from where it was a couple of decades ago. Bill Spellman has been um, uh, generating a lot of excellent research on this topic. And so um, uh, in a context where police are actually doing less than they ever were before, you know, I said before, well, they aren't really doing much with those, you know, uh, databases and stuff in the fusion centers well you add 500 cops who basically have not enough work to justify their existence and um and cut them loose and they may start using those databases and those intelligence resources in ways that they are not now i feel like that um that some of what we're you know looking at here is do we need police just for you know, the essential services or do we want them to be out there sort of, you know, scouring the, the you know, all their databases and all their, their uh, resources, you know, actively looking for, I'm not sure what, I, I think about a few years ago, the Austin Police Department and uh, I've helped work with the EFF to, to help quash this when they, when they did it, but they wanted to uh, uh, send police officers out with the equivalent of a, a stingray to figure out, um, no, not a stingray, I forget what the, the tool is called, I apologize. But um, uh, to figure out if basically people didn't have their, their routers um, with a password. And they wanted law enforcement enforcing those service provider contracts to say, you know, you have to put a password on your, your router. Um, and, you know, us and EFF at the time said, well, what in the world, how do you have enough cops available to do that? How is this a priority that you can, you know, spend time driving through the streets, you know, looking for someone whose router doesn't have a password on it? Is that really, 
a good use of your time. Well, if you have another 600 cops, then they'll have time for that all day because there's actually not enough crime to, to justify what, you know, we would use them for traditionally. It's a little before my time with EFF Austin, awesome, but I think you're referring to around 2010 Operation War Drive, uh, Scott. That's the one, Operation okay. War Drive. I'd totally forgotten the name of that, but yes. Yeah, it, for those who don't know, war driving is a hacking term where you drive around in a car and sniff for open uh, Wi-Fi networks and other things. So, yes. <laughs> um, and I think actually Scott, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, no, I was, the only thing yes. that I would also add to it is that I thought the bigger issue with the Blue Leaks hack was that they weren't properly deleting data. Like even like I could sort of understand that like if someone incompetently collects data and then someone reviews it, that um, you know it it should be deleted. I thought I thought their standard was thirty days unless they could you know meet a reasonable articulable suspicion standard. So in theory, you shouldn't be able to find any data out on you because it should be automatically deleted unless you're engaging in some criminal activity. But I think the issue with it is not only do they have the capacity where they don't have to make decisions about to delete data, um, but because there's essentially no oversight for the reasons that we talked about, you know, it's like sort of like your phone or your email. Why delete data if you don't really have to? <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that's what I found in Blue Leaks. There was a, an overwhelming amount of material that really had nothing criminal about it. Um, it really didn't need to be saved, and it was going back a few years. Um, they did have uh, an analyst who would, uh, I guess, look over the reports, and uh, they would pick out a few and follow up and in most cases determined there was nothing, but that was really just a, a small amount of the reports. An awful lot of them had no analyst comment and were just sitting there with nothing criminal about it. Um, so that's kind of troubling. And I think, you know, uh, something uh, Scott was mentioning just a minute ago about, uh, you know, police finding work for themselves and there isn't enough work. I think it ties pretty well into my next question, which also ties into some of uh, John's Blueberry's reporting, which is, um, as um, you know, we learned uh, fairly extensively via Blue Leaks, uh, ORIC employs what are known as threat liaison officers, or TLOs, which, to be blunt about it, they are basically anonymous law, non-law enforcement citizen informants to surveil Austin's communities. Uh, can all of you, with your various expertise, elaborate on the constitutionality of official secret informants and any possible solutions for addressing and possibly abolishing this practice. I'll let someone else take the constitutionality part, but just to kind of fill in information about the TLOs. Um, some of them are sworn law enforcement. We don't know how many. Uh, APD wouldn't, wouldn't tell us the division between sworn law enforcement and, and average citizens. They, uh, a PIO uh, originally told me they had 800 TLO officers. I found out a few months later from uh, the director, ARIC director, that they have about 1,400 uh, of the TLO officers. And what they do is file uh, suspicious activity reports. And um, we, in the Blue Leaks, there's a copy of one of these reports, and they break it down by categories including things like you know, photographing buildings and so forth, things that aren't suspicious, shouldn't be considered suspicious on a, a general way. Um, and then the other thing about the TLOs is they sign a non-disclosure agreement. And that was one of the things I found most troubling. And those non-disclosure agreements give them access to what they refer to as sensitive but unclassified information that's disseminated by Eric. And um, I, I think, I mean, I don't know exactly, you know, where that falls down, but I think that's most of the information they have. So for these citizens who dis, who sign one of these non-disclosure agreements, they get access, as far as I can tell, to all, if not most, of the information that, that Eric has. 
and yeah, and, uh, and before us uh, people chime in on maybe the constitutionality questions or just the ethics of this um and the dangers uh john i'm correct also though that you know your research uncovered that while some of the TLOs are things you might expect, like being security guards in various places, that many of them are things you might not initially suspect, like many of them are embedded in local churches, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, we didn't see a list, uh, you know, of the officers or anything, but um, there were some documents that kind of indicated that, yeah, these, these positions definitely fall outside of the realm of of law enforcement or even security officers and so forth so yeah but i mean it there again the lack of transparency meant we have no idea who these people are and and how many of them were just normal average citizens not sworn law enforcement and yeah i would say i agree that um and from when i was did a bunch of open records requests again back in the aughts it's been a while now but those SARS reports that he was talking about, the suspicious activity reports, um, were the bulk of what it seemed to be was coming in. And but um, there's also the the other uh, uh, thing is that they got access to all sorts of law enforcement databases that that in many cases just got uploaded. Um, for example, they uh, the reason the legislature began having you um, give your thumbprint when you get your uh, driver's license and at the time they wanted it to have all 10 fingerprints um, to get your driver's license and there was pushback on that and they ended up just doing thumbprints but all that was to get uploaded to the fusion centers and was immediately uploaded and and of course then goes from there to you know national security you know nsa all that so uh um uh, and, and same goes with uh, license plate readers. They were, uh, uh, you know, of course, the license plate readers just generate long laundry lists, of basically location information for all the people that they, you know, spot as, you, as they drive around town with them. And um, they're mainly using them to, to identify people with outstanding warrants. That's the, the primary thing that those are, are used for. Or occasionally, they'll spot a, a stolen car with it. But the bulk of it is, is, you know, people that have criminal justice debt. And, but all that also constitutes basically location data. You drive around and say, I saw this license plate here, this license plate there. All that was getting uploaded. And I'm not sure, frankly, that there was any, I don't know of any uh, temporal limit on how long they would keep it. Um, it was mentioned, you know, 30 days for some types of information, but that I think they're just uploading the databases. And uh, now it is worth mentioning that on license plate readers, um, Austin last year, one of the things that it did is in, in, uh, as part of the last year's budget process was terminate our license plate reader contra contract. Um, and, um, and, we're one of the only cities in Texas that that has done that. Um, but the the reason was, again, it was almost exclusively being used to identify people with outstanding warrants and to and and not really for crime investigation per se. And um, and and when you really started to look at the data, if you didn't just want to be out arresting, you know, people with you know for outstanding debt. Well, that was the main thing they were using it for. So, um, uh, and that's another instance where, you know, yes, these the, the the state fusion centers, you know, get all this information, but there still is some ability for the locals to control what data is generated, you know, on people in Austin. And and if we don't if we don't have that data, then it can't be given upstream. So. I, I can chime in with a couple of thoughts about sort of legality, constitutionality um, here. Uh, and uh, I thought that Effie, might be something in your wheelhouse. Yes, by all means. <laughs> Effie may well have more or, or different thoughts than, than I do here. Um, but I guess, you know, the, the basic answer to the question, oh my gosh, does the Constitution allow there to be hundreds of people just wandering around surveilling us? Uh, 
without disclosing that they're doing it or that they are tied in some way to law force enforcement? Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, totally, pretty much totally okay. Um, now, it's also like not new, right? It's sort of in terms of a concept um, that there would be people who are not known to you to be uh, communicating back with law enforcement or even instantly doing it because they're wired, et cetera. Um, but who in fact are, right, uh, sort of agents of, of law enforcement. The idea of having informants, um, you know, goes way back. Um, but, and here's one of the sort of first um, kind of lessons, I think, that, that we need to sort of internalize about particularly constitutional law in this space. Um, the rules that tolerate a lot of you know, information gathering by police um, were all created at a time when there were natural upper bounds on how much police really could learn about our lives without doing blatantly unconstitutional things like just barge into our houses and peek at what we're doing or hop into our, the backseat of our cars and ride around with us, right? And the upper, the natural upper bound was essentially sort of the limits of sort of human time, right? So take informants, right? Um, in a world where it really does require like, you know, police officers working in real time on a case to evaluate information and know whether it's going to be useful to them and like write reports about it and stuff like that, right? they're only going to be able to work with so many informants. They're only going to gather so many tips, right? In a world where, you know, as, as Effie was saying, like there's just no limit to the amount of info that you can store and also no limit to law enforcement's sense that like maybe not relevant right in this moment, but maybe it'll be relevant in the long term once I put it and connect the dots with the gazillion other pieces of data that I've mined from other things to create this sort of portrait of what's going on in this person's life. Well, then there's every incentive in the world to gather a lot of this and hang on to it, right? It's like my, my clothes from the 90s, like might as well keep, they might come back in style and oh gee, they did, right? Um, all this stuff is just hanging around for a moment in time when finally there's a dot to maybe connect it to, and we'll just put to the side for the moment questions about sort of the actual reliability of the kind of technology and then, you know, predictive analytics that are being generated out of it. So lesson one, right, is um, the constitutionality of this was all decided in a world that didn't have the sort of, you know, digital capacity to create these sort of long term stitched together, I'll use a, a word of art in law, mosaic understandings of our lives. And the second lesson that I would really want people to take away from my saying, yeah, it's totally constitutional, is constitutionality does not resolve normative questions here, or at least we shouldn't allow it to, right? Um, for all sorts of reasons, including that, right, the Supreme Court decides constitutional questions, especially about policing, with a strong um, uh, uh, preference <laughs> for creating a relatively low constitutional floor, right? Lest they sort of tie the states and localities hands too tightly. Um, but of course, right, states and localities are free then to create law above that constitutional floor, right? But there's a, there's a tendency, um, I think in our culture and maybe even particularly the culture around policing and it's a tendency that I think actually police um, exacerbate, particularly in the use of force space, but elsewhere as well, to sort of, um, uh, to, to kind of confuse questions of constitutionality with questions of normativity, right? So, um, so we should absolutely be having conversations about whether as a community, we find it tolerable, desirable, et cetera, to have these practices exist, notwithstanding the fact that push comes to shove, a court would let it happen if it were challenged, excuse me, if it were challenged. Well, you know, I think your, your excellent points there, I think very much tee up a question that I had ready that I really thought was kind of one in Effie's wheelhouse, where um, 
So want to go back to the topic of digital search warrants, they're increasingly becoming a tool of law enforcement. And there is concerns that the scope of what is considered in clear view with a digital search warrant goes far outside the bounds of traditional collection of evidence via physical search warrants. What do we know about APD's use of digital search warrants? And is there a reason to be concerned that vast amounts of data are being collected on suspects without reasonable oversight? Uh, yeah, so I can talk about this. I, I also would just say with respect to the previous question that I, I think Jennifer nailed it uh, rather well for the basic gist of everything. Like I, she covered the bases rather well. I also realized I forgot to say because I'm a government employee that, you know, I'm speaking in my individual capacity here and my views do not represent the Travis County Public Defender's Office or Travis County. But with that out of the way, um, Travis County uh, law enforcement, we actually, I actually now know it's beyond just APD in general, but they tend to issue what I've, what's sort of called all content search warrants. So what they tend to like to do is to say you've committed some sort of crime, um, we're aware you have a cell phone, therefore you wanna search that cell phone and they don't really limit the types of data that they do, they basically leave it to the uh, discretion of the officers to figure out, well, we think you're you know, committed to murder. We're not gonna specify what kinds of data is gonna be relevant to the murder. We just want a judge to say, hey, let us into your phone. Um, you know, We're gonna do that. I think the most aggressive use of uh, search warrants by APD that I have seen is that they will, um, when they seek access to someone's Google account, um, specifically, oftentimes their search warrants for that um, concern allegations that someone committed a crime um, that and they will then use the claim that most people who uh, use cell phones use the Android operating system in order to have the Android operating system, you need a Google account. Therefore, we think this individual has this Google account. Therefore, we want Google to turn over all data that possibly exists on this Google account that could be related to, you know, whatever crimes we have, because we're aware that people who commit crimes will communicate with other people, you search warrant terms when they have it. And uh, I think a lot of the issues that I have with those types of search warrants, particularly in the Google context, is that they're not very particular to the individual. So often they don't even know whether evidence exists on the Google account. They just know hypothetically some evidence could exist. And oftentimes they don't even necessarily know if the individual has a Google account. Um, they're just using the you know, consumer behavior that most people use Android. And so therefore uh, they likely have a Google account. Um, and so I think that lack of specificity is pretty problematic when you compare it to search warrants that can be used in the real world. Uh, for instance, the Supreme Court, or at least it's not the Supreme Court, most courts of appeals have found that the status of being a drug dealer in and of itself is not enough to get a search warrant for someone else's home. Even though it's well understood that drug dealers are likely storing drugs in their home, they need to be a little bit something, just a little bit more specific than that. And often individual the police are getting search warrants based off of, uh, because of that. I think you you know judges are supposed to be the vanguard and protecting from these search warrants, but I think you know most of the time in law school now people are not really taught about search warrants. You know when I went to law school we spent maybe half a day on it, and I think what you see isn't judges acting in bad faith, but you have judges being confronted with new technology. They're confronted with someone who is accused of committing some sort of crime, and. I think if they would maybe candidly say, I don't really know how to limit the search warrant. You know, I don't really know what the options are ahead of me. Um, and so that's why uh, it's particularly pernicious as I can go, I've talked a little bit now and there, but it's really hard to suppress search warrants for digital information uh, because of these rules called the good faith exception. Uh, I know qualified immunity has been in the news a lot, um, but the good faith exception basically says that if officers reasonably rely on a warrant and weren't given notice that what they were doing was in bad faith, uh, with bad faith sort of defined as a very, very low standard, uh, the evidence is going to come in. 
And it's pretty tricky to get around that. You know, I have some theories and have been successful in the past in Lexington. Uh, we'll see if I'm successful here or we can make law for it there. But that's sort of the, a little bit of a quick five minute summary sort of about what I had seen. Thank you so much for that. And I have from the audience, just kind of maybe a very quick follow up that ties in fairly well to that. Um, what is the state of things right now with regard to being uh, forced to provide the passcode to your phone if it's subject to a search warrant? So I do not know whether at least specific to Texas, whether Texas or how the Fifth Circuit has potentially resolved that issue. I know that there's lots of different uh, courts all over the U.S. that have basically teed this up coming out one way or the other. Um, and there's a various spectrum with it. I think that some people hold, some courts hold that, you know, you have to provide the passcode under this thing called the foregone conclusion doctrine, that the passcode isn't really the evidence that the cops want, as long as the cops are able to explain, hey, we know that you have evidence on your phone, therefore you have to open the passcode. Um, other courts have rejected that logic, basically saying, well, the passcode is something that could lead to some sort of testimonial incriminating response. And other courts have also said, yes, you know, this code that comes from Fisher versus United States, sort of in line with what Jennifer was saying earlier, like that case dealt with something that couldn't even have imagined, you know, the digital world that we live in and what the police are requesting. And so, you know, we can't really follow that case law given this particular factual circumstance that we have. And so there's often expanding uh, that rule with it. Great. But Jennifer may be able to add to that if she think disagrees or has more to comment on. Well, she no, certainly... you're hereby invited to come teach that. <laughs> <laughs> and and actually, my uh, the net, you know, if Jennifer has more thoughts on, she's welcome to elaborate. But my next question is sort of one that I included, uh, inspired by uh, some of uh, Jennifer's research slash uh, op eds. And I know she maybe has to run the first of all of us, so I want to make sure we get to this one, um, which is so. Austin um, has recently established an independent forensic science department. Now, yes, I'm well aware there are bureaucratic snafus in the actual launch of that, but in theory, we are launching an independent forensic science department with the goal of increasing accountability, transparency, and trust about the results of forensics investigations. And based, yeah, and actually, uh, Jennifer, before that became a thing, published an op-ed in the Austin Chronicle arguing for that. And uh, it, it sort of got me thinking, and this is just like, I don't actually know the answer, but I thought our panel might have interesting thoughts on it. Should APD's use of modern surveillance technologies potentially be subject to its own independent department staffed by legal and technology experts who can ensure that the use of these technologies will be carried out with proper oversight? Thoughts? Um, I'll, I'll start, um, but I'm sure that others have, have um, interesting thoughts here as well. I guess, um, you know, thinking about sort of the parallel, you know, how, how analogous the forensic science co um, context is, I think that, um, you know, what's similar <laughs> is a, just a sort of basic logic, right, of um, wanting to ensure that um, investigative techniques that are sold in part on the basis of having some um, actual claim to or veneer of kind of scientific objectivity um, are not sort of uh, then deployed and overseen in a context that is entirely sort of invested, right, in one particular um, uh, outcome for those technologies to 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 reach, right? Um, that's kind of the the you know one of the core concerns of locating a lab within a police department on a police budget, overseen slash controlled by people with knowledge of a case and who are invested in um, uh, in you know an arrest. It sort of taints what would otherwise be something closer to pure science. Now I'm putting lots of things in quotes because there are all sorts of complicating features here as elsewhere about really how pure that science is anyway, et cetera. Um, and actually just that's a, kind a, of a quick interjection. Um, and so, and 
I specifically think in the technological context of, you know, you talk about not being biased. And I think particularly with the use of potentially algorithms and the potential racial algorithmic biases of these algorithms, I'm thinking particularly maybe that is a good example of maybe where there, we might get some of the similar reasoning of why we might want an independent uh, department looking into these things. Yeah, I think that's a great thought, Kevin. And, and where I was gonna go next is to say, I think that in the universe of um, sort of police big data, one thing that's a little bit challenging about the sort of independent lab analogy is I do think that it's often more, much more difficult to kind of segregate, okay, we're going to do this process and then someone's going to pick up the process and use it in the context of the case. And we could, we could meaningfully sort of segregate those such that one person doesn't know what the other person knows. Um, but it might well be that, um, uh, uh, that algorithmic, certain kinds of algorithmic functions would do this. I mean, I do think in the context of, um, you know, uh, other, uh, uh, of, of kinds of biometric um, data other than DNA, right? So take, for example, facial recognition technology, <laughs> whole, whole, whole big, super important question about whether anyone should really be using it at all. <laughs> but if it were to be used, right, um, I think it is entirely possible to think an individual without any sort of vested, uh, you know, investment in the case or without particular knowledge about what's going on in the case could more objectively, right, um, use this technology as compared to someone who's sort of um, been involved in, in every aspect of the case. So I think there are some ways of, of segregating. But the last thing I'll say is that whether it's whether it's take that function outside the department um, or something else, the, the, the notion that there needs to be sort of external oversight and awareness of what's going on in this space absolutely holds. And, um, and you know, we've made some strides in that respect in the forensic science space, particularly in Texas, actually. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we should be making those strides here as well. I would just want to clarify um, one thing and then uh, just uh, echo something Jennifer said. But to clarify, Austin did um, set itself up to make its its forensic lab independent, just as the in Houston, they made their crime lab independent from the police department. And this is a best practice that the National Innocence Project has been promoting and, and the National Academy of Sciences actually in 2009 came out with an incredibly strong recommendation saying that your forensics should be outside of the police department. Um, because of House Bill 1900, the anti quote unquote defund the police legislation, um, Austin is not making its crime lab independent. That shut us down and prevented us from moving forward with an independent crime lab. Um, and so just wanted to make clear that, that while that got some publicity when they made the decision. What hasn't gotten as much publicity is that that had to get retracted because of that legislation. And they're, they're not going to do that unless there's some workaround to the House Bill 1900 that, that has not been figured out yet. Um, I do think that um, Jennifer's right that there's a, um, not every techno technological function has the same issues with it as the as the forensics so for example when the when the uh, uh, fingerprint examiner is trying to match fingerprints um, they really should just be looking at okay are the ridges the same are the loops the same you know the whirls all the all the different pieces um, and when a, a detective comes in and says well, you know, here's our, here's our file, and here's why we think this person is is, you know, guilty, and and here's why I want you to look at this. Basically, they're priming the pump and making it more likely that that examiner will use that knowledge outside the scope of the evidence in front of them to um, to and 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 bias their their judgment in some way. Whereas a lot of times when you're saying okay what information, you know, what your location data or um, 
you know, some of this other, you know, these technological functions, really they're, it, the, the investigators themselves are looking for leads and in, in the information itself and, and it's not exactly analogous. I think the, the facial recognition that, that Jennifer mentioned is to me the best example where I've seen, okay, you really do need to have somebody independent who like the fingerprint is saying, okay, um, you know, is this a match? Um, the way you use, say, license plate reader data or something may may not have that same type of, of uh, aspect to it. And, and so different types of, you know, data held by government or, 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 or uh, is going to, you know, raise different questions. Um, it's not all quite analogous to the forensics, but sometimes it is. And where it is, um, it would absolutely be a best practice to segregate that out. And I wish we were going to be able to do that for our, our forensic examiners, because there's no reason for somebody who's like examining the rape kit to see if it matches. Why, why should they have, you know, all the other information about the case? Um, well, we've seen situations where they have DNA mixture evidence that really could go either way. Is it necessarily probative? But the DNA analyst has all this additional information and turns around and, and just tells the detectives what they want to hear. And the Houston Crime Lab um, DNA scandals that, that in the aughts that sort of started all this were very much like that, where the DNA mixture evidence probably shouldn't have been considered probative, but because the cops were there telling them you have all, you know, we have all this other evidence, X, Y, and Z. They would, you know, lean in the direction the cops wanted them to. So um, it's a, it's a big issue. And it was a big setback for the legislature to say that we couldn't spin that crime lab off. And I, I actually, I think I vaguely remember about that bill happening. I actually, right before this, had uh, had looked at an article from a few months ago. They claimed there had been delays, but it was still going forward. Obviously, that was before the legislature concluded. Um, yeah. So I know we're about at what I said is time, and I know that um, we're going to lose uh, Jennifer here no matter what. Uh, we can keep going with a few more questions if the other panelists still have time and are interested, but I quite understand uh, that you, like myself, are all very busy people. So if we need to cut it off here, I am quite okay with that. Um, just let me know what you guys want to do. <laughs> I apologize for having to run. It's a cross-town child pickup situation that is on a time schedule. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to have to be out pretty quick. I can stay for another question or two, but I, I do all have right. to be here. In a well, moment. I think that what I'm going to do is, this is sort of the question I thought would be the final question. So I'm going to very quickly ask it. And if Jennifer has time to chime in on it, great. But otherwise, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, but I think I'll ask what I thought was going to be the final question. And then if people want to stick around for a couple more <laughs> questions, just for people to watch in the video later, uh, we can do so if people have time. But I once again, to tie it back to why we're here, uh, you know, motivated by this major proposition Austin is voting on uh, in less than a month. And actually, uh, early voting starts on, is it the 16th or 17th? I'd have to check the exact date, but it's very Monday. short. Um, Monday. Yes, Monday. Thank you. So yes, everybody watch but here or watching or listening to this later, uh, go out and vote sooner than later because, you know, it, it, even if you watch all this and you're still for Prop A, I mean, you know, I don't and I do want you to vote. But the point is, this is a major issue affecting Austin. And we at least we want every citizen weighing in on it. So because if we're going to spend all this money, it should reflect the actual will of the voters. So um, please go vote. Um, but my question for all of you, is there any reason to believe that Prop A will do anything to address the problems we've been discussing? Or what, is there reason to believe Prop A will make these problems worse? What do you say to a citizen who is worried about rising national crime rates and believes that APD investing greater funds into technological surveillance will make our city safer? Is there a way to increase public safety via technology without violating our constitution, sacrificing our civil liberties, and subjecting immigrants and communities of color to discrimination and racial profiling? I realize that question is doing a lot of heavy with lifting, so no pressure, but love to get your thoughts on that.
I guess the thing I'll quickly say before I before I jump off is I think the short answer to the question, is there anything about Prop A that's going to do anything to improve any of the problems we've just pointed to? The quick answer is no. Um, I think that the connection I'll make, though, to sort of the rhetoric around Prop A is and to sort of connect it to some of the rhetoric around these technologies is there's this idea um, in the sort of push for Prop A that people uh, are scared, uh, that people believe, um, contrary to reality, that Austin is facing a crime wave that is, uh, among other things, born of insufficient funding of policing, and that they need to solve that problem by massively increasing investment in, in policing. Um, and I think similarly on the side of technology here, uh, the fusion centers are just one example, but all of these technologies that, that police want to have at their disposal are exemplary. There's this sort of justification that goes something like, crime's a big problem, this is really helpful, because it's helpful, it's gonna solve more crime, we should be able to do it, do all of it, do more of it, do as much of it as possible. <laughs> and the, the, the fallacy in that is that even if it were true um, that these technologies are um, helpful to solve crimes on the margins, it might be true on the margins, it's simply not true in a democratic society that we do, that we embrace, that we tolerate all things that could be marginally helpful in detecting and, and stopping crime. Um, and so that simply can't resolve all of the thorny normative questions that surround whether we want to tolerate these kinds of, um, uh, you know, incursions into association and speech, whether we want to tolerate the racial disparities in use of these technologies, whether we want to tolerate um, the level of surveillance, um, whether we want to tolerate the expense that they present, right? All of these things really need to be debated. So completely aside from whether we think there's some marginal benefit um, uh, to doing something about crime from this. And so I, I hope that that's not lost. For me, the, um, the big connection between Prop A and these surveillance questions uh, goes back to our discussion earlier of, you know, say Operation War Drive. Um, and just to, you know, repeat, you know, my thought back then, uh, when we were discussing that, um, the idea that law enforcement has enough extra resources to just literally drive around street to street to street to see if you're letting your neighbor use your Wi-Fi or not, um, and then basically enforce your service provider agreement is, is really what that's all about. And that's, and it turned out the companies, the, ser the service providers themselves were the ones pushing APD to do that. Well, that's an incredible waste of law enforcement resources, even if, you know, in theory, you know, it's constitutional, okay for them to do it. Like, like Jennifer was saying, constitutional does not mean normatively good. Um, it doesn't mean that, that we should be doing it just because, you know, it, there's not some constitutional baseline forbidding it. And, you know, crime in Austin, the reality is is far, far lower than it was a couple of decades ago. Police officers respond to much less crime than they did two decades ago. We don't need the same number of police officers to, to respond to, to, to less crime. So you add 500, 600, 700 more cops, and what are they going to be doing with their days? That's, that's the question. And I think that, you know, just because the fusion centers have been, in my opinion, incompetent and, and, and have, because of their incompetence, failed to violate our civil liberties, doesn't mean that if you have a few hundred more cops with all this time on their hands and some of them are assigned to, to be creative and figure out ways to use that data, that it wouldn't be problematic, right? Things, you know, in, incompetence is not, is, is only, you know, only prevents that from being misused until the day someone competent shows up and begins using it more aggressively. 
And uh, so that's that. That's how I look at it. Is that um, uh, what are these cops going to be doing? Because the the reality is, where they're not going to all we they're not all assigned to be murder detectives. That's not what's going on. Um, most of them are going to be assigned to other tasks, and because we don't actually need that many cops, they're going to have to go out scouring the universe for new tasks. And you know, Operation War Drive is one example. The the Occupy surveillance is another. Um, you know, they they I forget. You know, John could tell you how many officers they had. Um, you know, infiltrating the Occupy movement and, and following up there. There could always be more, though. There's always more political movements. There's always another mosque. There's always another, you know, somebody that you can think, well, they could be doing something I should be looking into. And if I had more people, I could be looking into it. And so, um, uh, you know, to me, our public safety is, is far better served, for example, when in the city council um last year transferred 20 million out of the police department well what they spent it on was 67 new emts um emergency medical technicians for three new ambulances um the the a, a rape crisis center um I'm, I'm sorry domestic violence there excuse me um and uh uh those are public safety investments right I mean, if, if a woman's a victim of domestic violence and needs to get out of her home, ha her having a place to go contributes to her safety and contributes to public safety. And that investment is meaningful. And so if we are only going to invest in cops, and believe me, when you look at the city budget, if we spend money to hire 600 more cops, we're not spending money on anything else for a long, long time. And so, uh, you know, those that cost benefit analysis, what extra good are the cops going to do when there's less demand for those services than in the past, when uh, other services like the emergency medical technicians, like, you know, the domestic violence center, you know, need funding, that's really what's, that's the issue that's before the voters, because, um, you know, my belief is that we're not going to see a lot of additional public safety, marginal public safety benefit from, from the extra cops precisely because crime is already way down. Um, it's much more about what are those people are going to be doing um, and, uh, and what are the opportunity costs from spending money on that compared to other things. Yeah, I can chime in as well. I think at least with the technology part that I primarily talked about today, um, Prop 8 won't necessarily address that. Really what you need to address it beyond better court rules uh, is really more standard operating procedures among police manuals. If you were to look at the current general orders uh, issued by the Austin Police Department, they have essentially no guidance on how to handle really any of the digital technological tools that they have uh, and so if they really thought through um, that, and I think provided more guidance uh, to the officers and really set these are our internal practices and made them public, you would see uh, much greater protection of civil liberties there. Uh, with respect to, I guess, Prop A in general, I guess my current thoughts are is that I, I'm a little bit disappointed in the sense that I feel like Prop A is really more of a backlash to some of the more progressive movements that Austin has made with the election of District Attorney Garza um, and the events after uh, you know, various uh, resolutions uh, and measures that were passed after um, the incident with George Floyd where he was murdered. You know, and more con there have been crime increases in other cities, you know, I think Jacksonville, Florida or somewhere else where crime has gone up equally more or if not more than here. And it's not a story at all in other places. It's similar to what's happened in San Francisco. Uh, you know, the majority of individuals that, you know, I encounter in, and my office encounters in the criminal legal system are not violent felonies. Most of our caseload concerns misdemeanors, uh, which are primarily concerned with people who 
Um, even if whether they're guilty or innocent of a charge, they primarily in Austin have housing insecurity. Uh, as I think everyone knows, it's very difficult to um, get a house in Austin. And if you are charged with a crime and do not have any money to even afford an attorney for that, um, it's even harder for you to do that. If you have a drug issue in Austin, same issue with that. There's a lack of places that really deal with that. And I think that if you really dealt with some of these bigger issues, such as mental health care, which is also something that Austin is lacking in particular, and buffed those up a little bit more, you could see more bang for your buck in getting rid of you know, a lot of the reasons why uh, there are crime necessarily in there and where you spend your dollars you know, really impacts where else you can spend them. Um, so I, I just sort of say that, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do at the public defender's office is for people that need them, regardless of whether they're innocent or guilty of a crime, get them connected to services because I ultimately view the success of a client, not really whether, you know, I get them out of a charge or not, but how do I get them set up so that they don't really meet me again? Because if you've, if the fact that you've met me usually indicates that something's gone wrong, even if it's just that you were wrongly accused of a crime. Uh, beyond just whether you're innocent or guilty of something. Guys, I'm going to need to run, but thank you all for having me so much. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a pleasure. We'll, uh, we'll have to have you back for other If of Austin things. Your knowledge is always impressive. So thank you so much. Uh, and give Kathy my best. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, but I guess uh, uh, we've heard from everybody but uh, John on that question. John, did you have any thoughts on that question you wanted to check? I with? agree a lot with what the other panelists say, um, particularly echo what Scott said. Um, you know, from, from what I've seen at, at ARIC, as I mentioned, there was really not a lot of um, coverage of criminal activity. It, to me, it struck me as an awful lot of it, just a waste of time. And so I don't see how you know, increasing staffing at ARIC or throwing more money at is going to make that situation any better. If anything, it's just more of a waste. Um, and I just got to mention the, the um, undercovers with, with Occupy Austin, there were three of them. They spend an inordinate amount of time uh, around the group with little to no, you know, criminal activity. I mean, there was some minor civil disobedience and that's about it. Um, but the, they were tracking that group for months. Um, appeared to me to be a you know full time operation for them. Uh, they even met at ARIC uh, to coordinate the um, infiltration and the uh, entrapment that they they used to uh, create felony charges for seven of the participants. Um, so you know, to me, it's just, it's a lot of wasted. Uh, effort and money on uh, things that aren't really about cri fighting crime. And, and I, you know, and that's, I guess I'll say, you know, as I was even going to ask you, but you brought it up, you know, it's, it's fairly common in these undercover infiltration of activist groups, things that are right, that the undercover officers will try to entrap, uh, trick the members of the group into breaking the law, like be suggesting they break the law. I mean, from the incident in question, is there any evidence that those individuals would have uh, actually broken the law if they'd not been prodded to do so by the entrapping officers? Uh, well, I mean, it's hard to predict that way, but those officers actually built um, the devices using uh, PVC pipes that they used to lock arms. They, they blocked the port, uh, one of the entrances to the port of Houston for you know, a brief period of time during the day. But those officers actually supplied those PVC pipes, I think they're called lock boxes. So, uh, you know, and they built them themselves. I, so it's hard to know whether anybody else in the group Right, you can't, know the, you can't know an ultimate yeah. future. But they, but they actually went and made that much an effort, went and bought the materials, put them together, gave them to the, to the group to use. Um, so, you know, I, I, my sense would be no, they, that wouldn't have right. happened otherwise. Right, right. Um, okay, well, we've only got two of our panelists left and we are already quite a bit over time. And I think there were only two of my pre-prepared questions that we didn't get to. And I think we've had a 
pretty dang robust discussion. So I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I will make a note, John, I'm actually going to briefly follow up with you via email via your correction to one of my questions, one of the two we didn't get to. I need to pass along that info to EFF because they have that wrong in their database. So I'll be following okay. up with you on that. Sure thing. All right. Well, I want to thank our final two panelists so much. I want to thank everybody who's still here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, for those watching this video uh, later on our YouTube channel, I hope you learn some things about an important topic of law enforcement here in Austin that you maybe didn't know a lot about. And if you were on the fence about how you were going to vote on Prop A, um, or maybe even if uh, you were pro Prop A, I, I hope in either scenario, maybe we caused you to change your mind or question what you were thinking of voting. Because I think so actually our final question there, I think each of our four panelists really made a persuasive case that there are real problems that need to be addressed in our community, but it's about how we spend our money intelligently. And I really think they made a pretty slammed up case that Prop A is not the best use of our money. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you at the polls. Thank you. Right. Thank you.